and, um, and uh, uh, apes. So you can, you can stretch out I mean, a piece of a banana or, or a toy, depending on the species, and, and either pretend that you drop the thing, or you can just be, be nasty and pull it back again. So you can either intentionally, unintentional, no, I'm sorry, deliberately avoid handling or pretending to fail to hand it over to the uh, baby or, or, or the chimp. And from nine months and on, they react differently. That is, they get more upset if you tease them and pull it back again than if you pretend that you're just dropping it. If you just pre pretend that you're dropping the banana, the, the chimp will be a bit frustrated, but not as frustrated as when you're teasing it. And the same thing happens to the children. They can make a distinction when you, if you do something intentionally or unintentionally. This is a weak sign of, of uh, uh, showing that they understand the intentions of others. And people are discussing, I mean, there, this, uh, there is a lot of debate of what it really means to understand the intentions of others and so on. And the situation is, in, in brief, very unclear. Uh, when it comes to understanding the intention. And we know that it, it develops in, in, in children. I mean, from 9 to 12 months, uh, uh, roughly, they begin to understand the intentions of, of other people. And of course, as they grow, grow older, we're very good at understanding what other people have in mind and, and so on. We make mistakes, but we are much better than the other, uh, the other apes. Finally, imagining the beliefs of the others. What would it mean? Uh, when we have language, we can communicate about what I w think and, and know and, and so on. But in animals, we can't. And that makes it very difficult. Here is another observation from a baboon troop. This is little Paul. He is a juvenile. This is Mel, a, an adult female. She had managed to pull up a, a very nice root that is delicious to the baboons. This is Paul's mother. She is sitting out of sight, I mean, far away. Paul sees Mel eating this root. He wants it very much. So he... He sits down and screams, as if somebody has, had attacked him. His mother hears his scream, comes running. She thinks that Mel has been bad to, uh, to little Paul, so she chases away Mel. Mel drops the root, and Paul sits down and eats the root. So the question is, was this deliberate planning on, 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 on the part of Paul? Did he think? Did he think that if I cry, my mother will believe that somebody is bad to me and then come and help me. So the, the, the crucial question is that whether he had some kind of representation about the beliefs of his mother. We don't know, but the evidence speaks against it. Uh, probably, I mean, there were some other observations and I don't want to get into the details. Probably this was just trial and error. I mean, he was, he was excited, wanted the thing, he tried something, it was successful. And he actually repeated it a few, a few times. He was smart enough not to do it when his mother was in sight. Because if his mother had seen him when he, when he screamed, she would have uh, uh, called a bluff. She would have seen that he was bluffing. So he could understand that he should only scream when his mother didn't attend to him. So that, that he, he exploits that he understands the attention of his mother. But uh, probably not. I mean, most likely he doesn't understand the, that he can control her beliefs by, by, uh, by screaming. How can we know? Well, in children, it's not too, too difficult to do it. And the most classical thing is to use what's called false belief task. I mean, here's a description of a typical, typical experiment. I mean, you, you have three to five-year-old children. They are shown a Smartest tube. You know these oblong tubes with, with Smartest in them. And the children are asked what's in the tube, and everybody says there are Smartest or Goodies or, or whatever. And then they open the tube, and it turns out there are pencils in, 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 in this tube. All the children are surprised. And then you close the tube, and then you say, now, your friend is coming in. What will he say that is in the tube? And if you ask the three-year-old, they will say that Bert will th say that there are pencils in the tube. While a five-year-old will say that Bert will think there are smartest in the tube, but I know there, there, are, there are pencils. So the five-year-old can imagine that the other individual doesn't have the same knowledge as he or she has himself, herself. Uh, while a three-year-old doesn't have this capacity. It develops somewhere between a three and four-year-old, a little bit dependent on the, on the uh, circumstances. 
this capacity to think about the beliefs of others and realize that I don't know the same thing as I do, that I don't believe the same thing as I do. Animals apparently can't do this. I mean, if you have a dog and the dog has done something bad while you were away, eating the hammer or whatever, and you come home. The dog sits there by the door and is showing that it's ashamed, uh, that it doesn't want to have a punishment and, 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 and so on. It's, it's, it's very guilty because the dog believes that you already know what the dog has been up to. Uh, so, uh, but, and you can make a non-verbal version of this false belief task. You can do it without language. And it's been tested on, on, on chimps. They've all failed. No, no chimp has passed the false belief task. And no other animal, uh, a, a, as we know. There is some rumor that dolphins have passed it, but it's not, it's not very well controlled. It's, uh, it's a very recent, uh, recent experiment. It's, and um, it's unclear to what extent it's, it's valid. But no chimp, at least, uh, or no other primate, has passed the, uh, the false belief task. They have no representation of the, of the, of the beliefs of others. So, we have a very developed inner world, an understanding of, of the beliefs of others. We can understand the emotions, the attention, the intention, the beliefs, the knowledge of others. And we can do this iteratively, at least when we grow up. I mean, this understanding of the beliefs of others only occurs at around the age of four. Um, but I can understand that. I know that you know that I want, and, and, and so on. We have this uh, nested uh, inner world. We do it to three or maybe four layers, and then we get lost in, in our inner worlds. Um, so, in brief, the humans have a much more developed into subjectivity. We have much more, um, um, let's see, yeah, okay, we come to the next question here. Um, we have a much more developed inner world when it comes to representing the inner worlds of others. And I've given you some of the evidence and some of the components here. Now let's get to the question of self-consciousness. As I define self-consciousness, this is being aware of your own inner world, reflecting upon your own emotions, reflecting upon your own uh, intentions, what you want, reflecting upon your own knowledge. You realize that you don't know something, you go to your encyclopedia or to your friend to find out what's, uh, what you want to know, and so on. We, we can reflect upon what we don't know, what we want, and so on. The question is, can animals do it? We don't know, because we, it's very difficult to communicate about their, their, their thoughts. They, some species uh, recognize themselves in mirrors. Chimps do it, orangutans do it, some gorillas as well. Most of primates do it to some extent. One elephant does it uh, and uh, has shown it to be able to do it. Dolphins do it. Uh, but is this self-consciousness? No, it's not. Recognizing yourself in, in a mirror means that you're aware that this, what you see in the mirror is a picture of your body. I mean, it's kind of body consciousness. You recognize yourself on, on, uh, in a mirror. Chimps can recognize themselves from photos as well. That's much more difficult because you don't have the same uh, I interaction. Uh, but this is not self-consciousness. We don't... We don't um, know anything about how they represent their own knowledge. And as the false belief tests show, there is, I mean, as far as we know, there is no evidence showing that they can reflect upon their own, uh, on their own inner states. Some anecdotal evidence concerning the um, apes that have been language trained. I mean, there is the gorilla cuckoo who can sign, use American Sign Language, and she was asked, uh, about why she bit a trainer three days ago. And she answered, because I was angry. She wasn't angry when she, when she signed it. And this is some kind of reflection. Uh, she bit this and she could somehow reflect on that she was angry when she, when she did this. This is thinking about herself three days earlier. But that's, I mean, first of all, she's been living with humans all her life and she has been language trained and so on. Uh, and uh, that's really an exceptional uh, statement. Most of the time, what we see in the communication with the language-trained language apes show no signs of, of uh, uh, self-consciousness. But they might be on, on, the, on the verge of it, in particular if they've been living with, with, with humans. So, I have distinguished these components of the theory of mind. And if I map on onto 
both phylogenetically and uh, developmentally. We find this, all, all animal, mammals that have been uh, examined have shown empathy. 